Bob Goodlatte, the chairman of the committee, no now speaking. The sheer volume of detailed information that is collected. Today, I hope to get answers on the extent of data collection and use by Google. In addition, decades ago, Congress passed the Communications Decency Act, including Section 230 of that act, which allows service providers to remove lewd, lascivious, excessively violent, or otherwise objectionable content from their platforms. This law allows service providers to remove illegal materials, including child pornography and content that is illegal under our intellectual property laws. While meant to allow them to block illegal, obscene, and harmful materials, there is some discretion that service providers, by necessity, must use to make decisions about what content is harmful or objectionable. Given Google's ubiquity in the search market, Google is often consumers' first and last stop when searching for information on the Internet. As such, this committee is very interested in how Google makes decisions about what constitutes objectionable content that justifies filtering and who at Google makes these decisions. Given the revelation that top executives at Google have discussed how the results of the 2016 elections uh, uh, do comply with Google's values, these questions have become all the more important. While it is true that Google is not a government entity, and so it does not have to comply with the First Amendment, the American people deserve to know what types of information they are not getting when they perform searches on the Internet. The market works best when information about products and services is readily available. And so today, on behalf of this committee and the American consumer, I hope to get answers from Mr. Pichai regarding who at Google makes the judgment calls on whether to filter or block objectionable content and what metrics Google uses to make those decisions. I want to thank Google's CEO for his willingness to testify today and to answer these and other questions. With respect to search results, algorithmic screening is the primary means through which Google sorts data and information. Google's search algorithm, for example, calculates what is presented to a user based on the variables the user inputs into the search bar. At its best, Google's algorithm reaches the best answer in the least amount of time while providing choices to the user by ranking pages most relevant to the search inquiry. Of course, by ranking pages, Google search always favors one page over another. This kind of bias appears harmless. After all, the point of a search is to discriminate among multiple relevant sources to find the best answer. This process, however, turns much more sinister with allegations that Google manipulates its algorithm to favor the political party it likes, the ideas that it likes, or the products that it likes. There are numerous allegations in the news that Google employees have thought about doing this, talked about doing this, and have done it. The dangerous implications to a fair democratic process cannot be understated. One study performed by psychologist Robert Epstein has revealed that Internet search rankings have a significant impact on consumer choices, mainly because users trust and choose higher-ranked results more than lower-ranked results. After performing five relevant double-blind, randomized, controlled experiments using a total of 4,556 undecided voters representing diverse demographic characteristics of the voting populations of the United States and India, the study revealed that biased search rankings can shift the voting preferences of undecided voters by 20 percent or more. The shift can be much higher in some demographic groups, and search ranking bias can be masked so that people show no awareness of the manipulation. The potential for this kind of bias is clearly problematic and is further compounded by the fact that Google every day collects mountains of information about its users while they are actively engaged with a Google product, <coughs> or even when they are not. According to a study conducted by Vanderbilt University, a dormant, stationary Android phone with Chrome active in the background communicated location information to Google 340 times during a 24-hour period, or at an average of 14 data communications per hour. 
The, the collection of location data may be obvious to most users, but they are often unaware of the many sensors that the Android platform supports, including an accelerometer, a barometer, and a photometer. These photometer, these sensors, in addition to the cameras and microphone on a mobile device, can collate into a very accurate picture of where a user is, what they are doing, and who else is there. The shocking amount of information that Google collects via its phones was recently featured on Good Morning America, in which a reporter using an Android phone with no SIM card that wasn't connected to the Internet discovered that the phone collected the device's movement, even identifying the mode of transportation, such as the subway or even a bicycle, and at times taking 10 sensor readings per minute. Moreover, Google's practice of reinforcing its dominance in light of allegations of self-serving bias creates little choice for consumers across the spectrum of Internet-based products or services. Given that Google's ads show up on non-Google websites and Google's search engine is being used as the default search tool on other products, such as the Apple phone, it is almost impossible to avoid Google altogether. Google, in many things, Google is many things. It's one of the largest data collectors ever seen in human history. It's an advertiser that can get the right product to the right customer at precisely the right time. Google is also an internet giant, directing over 3.5 billion searches per day. With this massive authority, however, comes the potential for far-reaching abuse. The mere suspicion that Google manipulates its products and features for self-serving or even political purposes raises serious concerns about its business practices, its impact on free speech and our democratic process, and Americans' trust that the information gathered about them in their day-to-day -day lives is done with their knowledge and is not being used against them. My hope is that through our inquiries today, we will ensure more transparency and accountability going forward. Last, despite the nature and scope of today's hearing, Google is still the story of the American dream. The company was started by two individuals in a garage and grew to be one of the most successful companies in the world. Two decades ago, we could not fathom instantaneous access to more information than that which is contained in all the encyclopedias in the world. Now we take that for granted because of the innovative services Google provides. With that, I want to again thank our witness for his presence here today. I look forward to your testimony. It's now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, our society has become increasingly reliant on social media and other online platforms to obtain, create, share, and sort information. This information helps us make decisions ranging in importance from where to make dinner reservations to which candidate to vote for in a presidential election. The public's increasing use of these platforms has generated many positive benefits for society, but it, is, it has also given rise to some troubling trends. Google is among the dominant firms in this field. As such, given the public's widespread use and reliance on its products and services, there are legitimate questions regarding the company's policies and practices, including with respect to content moderation and the protection of user privacy. But before we delve into these questions, I must first dispense with a completely illegitimate issue, which is the fantasy dreamed up by some conservatives that Google and other online platforms have an anti-conservative bias. As I have said repeatedly, no credible evidence supports this right-wing conspiracy theory. I have little doubt that my Republican colleagues will spend much of their time presenting a laundry list of anecdotes and out-of-context statements made by Google employees as supposed evidence of anti-conservative bias but none of that will actually make it true. But this fact-free propaganda does help generate the mistrust that the majority leader referred to a few moments ago. And even if Google were deliberately discriminating against conservative viewpoints, just as Fox News and Sinclair Broadcasting and conservative talk radio hosts like Rush Limbaugh discriminate against liberal points of view, that would be its right as a private company to do so not to be questioned by government. During the Reagan administration, about 35 years ago, the Federal Communications Commissioners appointed by Ronald Reagan 
abolished what we used to have called the Fairness Doctrine, which placed an obligation on broadcasters who use the public airwaves to be fair to different points of view. This question might be relevant if the Republican members wanted to bring back the Fairness Doctrine and expand its scope to social media companies. I doubt we will see any interest in doing so. But we should not let the delusions of the far right distract us from the real issues that should be the focus of today's hearing. For example, we should examine what Google is doing to stop hostile foreign powers from using its platform to spread false information in order to harm our political discourse. It has been more than two years since the 2016 election, yet this committee has not held a single hearing focused on Russia's campaign to manipulate online platforms to undermine American democracy, despite the fact that it is the consensus view of our intelligence agencies that Russia engaged in a massive disinformation campaign to influence the 2016 election. I hope that Mr. Pichai can tell us what actions Google has taken to counter this unprecedented attack and what gaps remain in its defenses without being so specific as to give a, uh, a guidance to foreign powers. This may help Congress determine what more can be done to further insulate our democratic processes from foreign interference. We should also examine how Google enforces community standards that prohibit racist or bigoted threats and other inappropriate conduct. While internet platforms have produced many societal benefits, they have also provided a new tool for those seeking to stoke racial and ethnic hatred. The presence of hateful conduct and content on these platforms has been made all the more alarming by the recent rise in hate-motivated violence. According to statistics rele recently released by the FBI, reported incidents of hate crimes rose by 17 percent last year compared to 2016, marking the third consecutive year that such reports have increased. The horrible massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the recent murder of an African-American couple in a Kentucky grocery store, the killing of an Indian engineer last year in Kansas are sadly not isolated outbursts of violence, but the most salient examples of a troubling trend. We should consider to what extent Google and other online platforms may have been used to foment and to disseminate such hatred, and how these platforms can play a constructive role in combating its spread. As the dominant player in its field, Google possesses significant market power. It is also useful to examine its policies and practices to ensure that other companies are able to compete in an open and fair marketplace. There are also concerns about the prevalence of pirated material available on Google and other internet platforms at the expense of legitimate content. Finally, it is important to know what Google is doing to protect its users' data privacy and data security. The Wall Street Journal recently reported that Google discovered last March that a bug in its social media platform, Google Plus, had exposed the private profile data of up to 500,000 users to third-party developers, but it opted not to disclose the issue publicly, not even to those who may have been affected at the time. And just yesterday, the company announced that it had discovered another Google Plus bug that may have exposed the private profile data of millions of users. While Google has so far found no evidence that developers have, in fact, abused these bugs, or that any user profile data has been misused in any way, incidents like this still raise legitimate questions about what types of data exposures a company is obligated to disclose publicly. It also raises questions about how much control users should have over their own data and how such controls should be regulated. I am also disturbed by recent reports that Google is developing a search engine for the Chinese mainland market. According to these reports, the search engine would not only accommodate Chinese government censors, it might allow the Chinese government to track individuals by linking search terms to the user's mobile phone number. Unfortunately, in this, our fourth hearing devoted to entirely fictitious allegations of, of anti-conservative bias by Internet companies, we will waste more time and more taxpayer money on elevating well-worn right-wing conspiracy theories instead of concentrating on the substantive questions and issues that should be the focus of our hearings. Our committee can and must and will do better. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. We welcome our distinguished witness, and if you would please rise, I'll begin by swearing you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I 